According to this article in The Guardian, sea levels are going to rise by at least 20 feet. It says a catastrophic level of sea rise is assured. All but certain, it says, and much worse than many think. Sounds bad. Is it true? Well, let's have a look. It's fair to say that the public gets somewhat confused about all of the claims and the counterclaims relating to climate change, and no more so than in the area of sea level rise. So it would be useful if national newspapers, the mainstream broadcast media, and politicians as well, if it's not too much to ask, could be clear about what the current research actually says. In his 2006 film An Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore predicted that melting ice would release enough water to cause a 20-foot rise in sea level in the near future. He wasn't more specific than that. If you thought that the near future might mean, you know, the next couple of decades, we're not far off living in that future right now. He might have meant the next century. I mean, in geological terms, that's five minutes from now. It wasn't clear. But largely, it gets counted as one of several exaggerations or unsupported statements made in that film. Well, last week, The Guardian was singing a similar song. Sea levels are going to rise by at least 20 feet. No coulds, no maybes, simply a very unequivocal message. The article is by Harold Wanless, a professor of geology and regional studies at the University of Miami. The climate emergency is bigger than many experts, elected officials and activists realise. As a first sentence, it sounds profoundly impressive for something that when you look at it closely is ultimately meaningless. But let's not dwell on that, let's go on for the substance. Humanity's greenhouse gas emissions have overheated the Earth's atmosphere, unleashing punishing heat waves, hurricanes and other extreme weather. That much is widely understood. Well, with respect, those things are not so widely understood. The data shows that the cumulative heat experienced in heat waves has increased globally and regionally, driven by the overall number of heat wave days, not to date, driven by increases in intensity, which you would have taken as implied by that statement. Unleashing hurricanes would lead you to think that the number of hurricanes has been going up, which it hasn't been. There is some belief that the intensity of hurricanes has risen, and that is what would be expected. Similar or even lower numbers of hurricanes, but at higher intensity. But the attribution of specific extreme events to climate change is a difficult process, one that certainly doesn't merit the blasé certainty in that paragraph. Let's be clear, if the planet continues to warm on its current trajectory, which is what we expect, then you will see more consequences of that sort. But we need to be clear about what's expected and not be hyperbolic about it. But the focus of the Guardian article is sea level rise specifically, so let's not get distracted by this throwaway paragraph except to question its status as undisputed truth. The larger problem is that the overheated atmosphere has in turn overheated the oceans, assuring a catastrophic amount of future sea level rise. As oceans heat up, the water rises in part because warm water expands, but also because the warmer waters have initiated major melt of polar ice sheets. As a result, average sea levels around the world are now all but certain to rise by at least 20 to 30 feet. The things that are demonstrably true here, there has been a lot of heat transferred to the oceans, as you can see in this graph from the 2019 NOAA State of the Environment report. NOAA says this, More than 90% of the warming that has happened on Earth over the past 50 years has occurred in the ocean. Recent studies estimate that warming of the upper oceans accounts for about 63% of the total increase in the amount of stored heat in the climate system from 1971 to 2010, and warming from 700 metres down to the ocean floor adds about another 30%. So that's true. And also true is that this feeds into sea level rise because of the expansion of warmer water and the melting of land-based ice sheets as well as glaciers. The things that are layered on the top, though, include the phrase catastrophic amount of future sea level rise, which is presented as a fact with no qualifications, and then again with the statement average sea levels around the world are now all but certain. <laughs> 
to rise by at least 20 to 30 feet. And that last claim provides a link to a scientific paper to justify it, and it's this one, by James Hansen et al, 2016. It was widely covered by the media at the time, which you can understand, even just from its dramatic title. Ice melt, sea level rise and superstorms. Evidence from paleoclimate data, climate modelling and modern observations that 2 degrees C global warming could be dangerous. I see a could in that sentence, always a bit of a flag. The paper puts forward an argument that paleoclimatic data suggests that the climate forcing that humans are introducing to the atmosphere should result in much higher rates of sea level rise than the models currently suggest. The focus of our paper, developed in 2007 when the first author, which is James Hansen, read several papers by co-author P. Harty. Harty used geological field data to make a persuasive case for the rapid sea level rise late in the prior interglacial period to a height of 6 to 9 metres relative to today. Our approach is to postulate existence of feedbacks that can rapidly accelerate ice melt, impose such rapidly growing freshwater injection on a climate model and then look for a climate response that supports such an acceleration. So the paper is proposing a position. It thinks there was more rapid melting in the distant past. It's tried to introduce different factors to a climate model that could reproduce such an effect in the modern context. Fine, sounds like an interesting and potentially useful exercise. It doesn't claim to provide a proof that would merit the certainty of that Guardian article reference. Not to my eyes, anyway. Mind you, I'm not a scientist. I might well miss the point. But when referencing scientific papers, you also need to see if other scientists have commented on the paper and whether its content is the subject of scientific debate. I came across two formal responses to this one. The first was this one from Drifut et al. The authors, all being mainstream meteorologists with a reasonable number of published and well-cited research papers. The title of the paper is more suggestive than is justified by the scientific evidence. The conclusions cannot be regarded as being robust as they are insufficiently supported by both modelling results and observations. Our arguments for inferring this assessment are based on four points, namely... 1. The climate model used possesses large biases, cannot be considered to be state-of-the-art, and misses essential processes. 2. There are issues with timing of the events inferred from the paleo data. 3. The Eemian, which is the historical period that the paper refers to, cannot be directly compared to any future climate that we might anticipate. And 4. Even if all these issues would not exist, the extreme abrupt events reported in this article need some preconditioning and would be much more likely to occur after 2100 or even after 2200 than in the coming century. Therefore, we would recommend present this work with a lower level of alarmism and avoid terminology as dangerous in the title and upfront displays of the paper. Then there was a second response by Engel et al. They focus on one specific part of the paper. Given our thematic and regional research backgrounds, we solely comment on section 2.2, where geologic findings are presented in support of the hypothesis of a late Eemian increase in temperature gradients and extreme storm magnitudes unprecedented in our days. In general, our comment is motivated by the unbalanced discussion of the origin of these geologic features, as a whole body of literature coming to diverging conclusions is ignored. Now, I'm not qualified to make judgment about this debate between qualified scientists. We should resist the temptation to jump to conclusions based on which side you'd prefer to believe, whichever side that may be. What I do feel qualified to conclude is that the paper does not stand as an unchallenged statement of scientific proof that would justify the sentence in the Guardian article, average sea levels around the world are now all but certain to rise by at least 20 to 30 feet. So, let's get back to the article. Wanlis then goes on to speculate. If seas rise 20 feet over the next 2,000 years, our children and their descendants may find ways to adapt. 
But if seas rise 20 feet or more over the next 100 to 200 years, which is our current trajectory, the outlook is grim. In that scenario, there could be two feet of sea level rise by 2040, three feet by 2050 and much more to come. Let's ignore the fact that Wanless apparently expects his children to be alive in 2000 years time. Attention to detail, clearly not his overwhelming strength. And let's assume just for the moment that his assertion of our current trajectory is true. Do we think the proposition here is right, even if that should be the case? If seas rise over the next 2,000 years, our descendants may find ways to adapt. Indeed, even if they progress with the speed of a three-legged tortoise, they may be able to adapt on that time scale. Why wouldn't they be able to on the 200-year time scale? I mean, it's an open question. There may be a good answer to it. But 200 years ago, we hadn't even begun the Industrial Revolution yet. Are you really telling me that 200 years is too short a time to adapt to sea level rise? That's not to downplay it in any way. There would be big challenges to be overcome in that scenario. But it's not obvious that there's anything but Wanless's own intuition behind that statement. Indeed, he says this. Two to three feet of sea level rise may not sound like much, but it will transform human societies the world over. In South Florida, where I live, residents will lose access to fresh water. And he provides a link to support that claim. Well, that link is to an article by Wanless himself in The Conversation from 2014, where he said this, The US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, published its assessment of sea level rise in 2012 as part of a national climate assessment, including estimates based on the limited and maximum melt of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. It anticipated a raise of 4.1 to 6.6 feet, 1.25 to 2 metres, by 2100, reaching 2 feet, 0.6 metres, by around 2050, and 3 feet, 0.9 metres, by around 2075. Always check the original sources. So I pulled up the 2012 assessment of the sea level rise as part of the National Climate Assessment, and it turns out that Professor Wanless has top-sliced what it said to give only the most extreme figures. It reports four global sea level rise scenarios, the lowest being 0.2 metres increase by 2100, the intermediate low as 0.5 metres, the intermediate high of 1.2 metres and then the highest one of 2 metres. The report says this, our highest scenario of global sea level rise by 2100 is derived from a combination of estimated ocean warming from the IPCC AR4 global sea level rise projections and a calculation of the maximum possible glacier and ice sheet loss by the end of a century. The highest scenario should be considered in situations where there is little tolerance for risk, e.g. new infrastructure with a long anticipated life cycle, such as a power plant. And that, of course, is the proper function of a high-end scenario like that, to inform planning for situations where there are high-cost consequences and very low resiliency in the face if that worst case were to happen. That's not the same as taking the high-end scenarios and presenting them as the full range, which is what Wanlis did. Wanlis presented the high intermediate scenario as being his low end, and that is deeply misleading. That source was back in 2012. Lots has happened since then, of course. Already by 2013, in other words, before Wanlis wrote his article for the conversation, the IPCC did not include that top-end estimate in its AR5 September 2013 report. In fact, at that point, the IPCC stated that it had low confidence in estimates of sea level rise above its top end of 0.82 metres. That was then. In 2018, the IPCC produced its updated report on the oceans and the cryosphere. It refers to the IPCC emission scenarios because, of course, what happens in the future depends on what we do in the meantime. If everyone decides to invest heavily in coal from now on, the RCP 8.5 scenario applies. As we've discussed here before, it's mistakenly referred to by some as business as usual. In actual fact, it's the highly unlikely high-end worst case, which is not the same thing. So with that in mind, it says this. 
Future rise in global mean sea level caused by thermal expansion, melting of glaciers and ice sheets and land water storage changes is strongly dependent on which representative concentration pathway, RCP, emission scenario is followed. Sea level rise at the end of a century is projected to be faster under all scenarios, including those compatible with achieving the long-term temperature goal set out in the Paris Agreement. Global mean sea level will rise between 0.43 metres, 0.29 to 0.59 metres likely range, RCP 2.6, and 0.84 metres, 0.61 to 1.1 metres likely range, RCP 8.5, by 2100 medium confidence. So let's be clear, the top end of the likely range for the unlikeliest extreme scenario, according to this report, is 1.1 metres. More likely we're talking about half that. Now that's the consensus view, but individual studies can stretch that range. So for instance, one of the authors that rebutted the Hansen et al paper, Professor Drifut, co-authored a later study that tried to establish what, given the most pessimistic but possible projections of Antarctic mass loss, could be the upper end worst case scenario. And it was in line with the NOAA 2012 document, giving a top end possible rise between 2 and 2.5 metres by 2100. It depends on us deciding not to bother with any of that reducing emissions stuff, but even so. The point is that something that's highly unlikely can still happen. And people get that wrong all the time. If they see the weather app on their phone saying that there's a 70% chance of rain tomorrow and then it doesn't rain, they may well say, oh, the forecast was wrong. But 30% probabilities, of course, happen all the time. So, no. Indeed, in another context, I saw someone commenting recently that the COVID vaccines must be useless because over 5,000 people have been reported to have caught COVID after having been vaccinated. That was out of more than 7 million people who had been vaccinated. So, yes, if you have something with a 95% efficiency, 95% probability of success, and then you apply it millions of times, some unlucky people are going to get the 5% outcome. All of which is to say that the worst case scenarios are unlikely but not impossible. BP did not prepare for the Deepwater Horizon accident because it was held to be extremely unlikely. And that was probably true, but it happened anyway. The same applies to the best case scenarios, of course. The same ones that Wanderlust didn't even bother to include in his range. Which is why predicting the future is not the same as facts. And you watch the emerging research and the data with an open mind. What you don't do is write articles in mainstream newspapers describing the worst case outcome as more or less certain. Incidentally, The Guardian notes that Harold Wanless was named as one of Politico's top 50 visionaries transforming American politics. That immediately suggests a campaigner more than a scientist. If you look at the Politico piece on him, it turns out he shares the slot with Philip Stoddart. They are labelled the climate doomsayers. And it says this, Wanless has said for years that much of South Florida would sink his prediction that the state's southern tip has only half a century left above water has earned him the nickname Dr. Doom. He predicts that the rate of sea rise will be much faster than most models suggest. Miami Beach will experience 10 to 30 feet of sea rise by 2100, he says. So, yes, an outlier and a campaigner. Now, in the terms of the rest of the Guardian article, what Wanless calls for is, on the face of it, relatively mainstream. The solution to rapidly rising sea levels is twofold. Humans must stop putting more heat-trapping gases into the atmosphere and we must extract much of what we've already put up there. First part of that is in line with where governments are largely going. I expect, like all campaigners, he would say they should go faster. His main point of difference is to argue that carbon capture technologies should aim not only to achieve net zero, but then to progressively reduce CO2 concentrations back down to pre-industrial levels, so that ice melting stops more quickly than it would otherwise. And that's because a lot of the ice melt and the sea level rise continues going even after net zero has been achieved because of the long lag times. And it's a fine argument to make, but the carbon capture technologies are a long way 
from being able to deliver even net zero right now. So it's kind of a moot point. Unfortunately, he then rapidly slips back into the doom-laden rhetoric to finish off leaving this point hanging in the air. Without such measures, there will come a point sooner than many people realise when civilization as we know it will greatly weaken or outright collapse. Oh really? That is a prediction offered without any sort of supporting evidence and it's the signature of lazy catastrophists everywhere. There's this bad thing and then there's another bad thing and oh there's a pretty bad thing. And you add them all together and you get the collapse of civilization. Well, maybe you do, but probably not. We've seen that certain forms of behaviours may change in the face of urgent challenges, in times of war or hardship. Generally, societies adapt and they cope with such issues. And it's not obvious from the expected impacts of climate change where such a potential collapse would even come from. In his 2011 paper on collapse and the environment, Carl Butzer showed that historical societal collapses were multi-causal and rarely abrupt. And modern civilizations, he believed, had many more stabilizing factors than societies that had collapsed in the past due to better information, innovation and intensification. Societies with such factors are more resilient in the face of shocks and setbacks and more likely to reconstitute themselves to fit new realities. Now, there might well be an academic riposte to that, a well-evidenced argument to be made to the contrary. I'd be interested to see it. But the point is that it's not advanced in Wanless's argument as an intellectual proposition. It's just dropped in as a lazy aside, as being self-evident. Always be on the lookout for such little polemical riders dropped in, riding on the back of a main argument. Such things get repeated over and over and over, and by the end they gain the status of assumed academic respectability. So, where does that leave us? The Guardian article is not presented as an opinion piece. It's not disclosed that this is an outlier opinion. Outlier opinions can turn out to be correct. They should not be presented as self-evident truth, ignoring the fact that the majority opinion has come to a different conclusion. Doing so unnecessarily alarms people who are not in a position to do an analysis of the sort that I've given here, particularly given how often people are presented with this sort of message via The Guardian or elsewhere. A general rule of thumb when dealing with contentious issues of science is that the people who know the most tend not to make unequivocal statements expressing certainty. Genuine certainty in science is rare. The people who are the quickest to suggest that certainty exists, those people should carry the least credence on the scale of reliability. Now that doesn't mean that they will never be right, because the law of averages will be kind to a minority of them some of the time. Just the same as COVID-19 vaccines will fail a minority of the people some of the time. It's not a reason to give them credence. Some people think that it's all good and the end justifies the mean. You should dramatise the worst potential harms in order to motivate decision makers. OK, but that's campaigning, not science. And if campaigning is not solidly based on the science, then you run the risk that what you're calling for as an outcome is not actually the best response to our situation. In other words, you may be doing more harm than good. An honest cause is best served by truth. With all of the scenarios and the uncertainties and the grey areas, messy though they may be. In this case, The Guardian has done a disservice to the truth. Other news sources are available.